I'm going to sort of start things off, and what we're going to talk about today is an opportunity, and it's an opportunity that all of us have that we're not always embracing and really leveraging as, as much as we could. I work at a company, Viacom. We are a holding company that tries to entertain people. We want to delight and amaze and really create enjoyable experiences. And part of my job at Viacom is to use data and technology and all these fun, buzzy terms like machine learning to try to use that information to help understand audiences. And so that's what I normally talk about, and I'm not going to talk about that at all today. I think you know, what I wanted to talk about is something that obviously has been you know, front of mind for a lot of us over the last couple of years, but particularly the last couple of weeks, and that is this idea that data and data collection and data sharing is somehow inherently evil, and that the technologies that we're creating to do this data collection and data sharing is also evil. And I, for one, think that that is not the case at all. I don't think the machines are going to at some point all rise up and, and, and kill us. Uh, this is not you know, a, a Terminator movie. But, and the reason I think that is because data collection and data sharing is actually one of the linchpins of human civilization. Without it, we probably would all not be here because we would have been killed off by some medieval disease. And I think you know, what's been going on recently, obviously, with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica and a lot of these, and, and there's, there's a big thing happening with data this Friday that ha that's a four-letter acronym, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are aware of. And I think we've kind of forgotten because we're a little bit fearful and we're a little bit paranoid around data and we think that it's going to somehow ruin us all. But I want to just caution that because without data collection and out, without data sharing, a lot of the technologies that we want to build, a lot of the machine learning algorithms and the AIs that we want to help move civilization into that next phase are going to be a lot harder to do without data collection and data sharing. And so what we're really concerned about is not the act of collecting data and then sharing it. It's the fact that we as human beings are unethical and irresponsible and don't have the guardrails in place to properly do the data collection and sharing in a way that won't necessarily harm the individuals of who the data originated from. And so I really want that to sort of begin and frame the discussion about what we're gonna talk about today, because this problem around not solving the right problems or using data or using um, other people's information irresponsibly has really started out of the culture of Silicon Valley that has now spread. And the culture of Silicon Valley was originally really about these lofty goals of how do I put a computer in every person's hands? How do I create this internet that democratizes information so that anyone around the world can have the same access to information no matter their socioeconomic background? That isn't really the narrative that has been coming out of Silicon Valley I would say over the last five to 10 years. What's coming out of Silicon Valley is something that Riva, Melissa, Tez, and others have much more articulately expressed than I'll ever, and that is Silicon Valley has lost its grasp on what a problem is. They've created this narrative that romanticizes the work that they do, romanticizes the companies that they invest in as being game changers, as being innovative, but in fact, they're really not trying to solve our problems as human civilization. They're solving we problems. And the we problems are the problems or the inconveniences of those individuals that are living in Silicon Valley. <laughs> um, I can take over because I live in Silicon Valley. Um, I grew up close to Silicon Valley, have spent time in New York City, so in Silicon Alley and Silicon Valley. And there are a couple of things I think that have become responsible for this disconnection between where we started, where Steve Jobs started, where these sort of lofty goals of what technology could do, um, and, and where we've um, seemed to find ourselves. Um, a sort of sobering statistic that I experience on a daily basis is um, last year in 2017, 2.2% of all venture funding went to female founders. So, 2.2% out of 100% went to female founders. And I think what 
we can say as part of the, the component that is responsible for where we've come in terms of what kinds of problems we're solving is who's sitting at the table um, because representation matters. And if we're going to be solving problems that are big and hard and scary, um, I mean, this is not untrue, but, but if we're going to solve big problems, we need to have everyone at the table, and we need to have a different, diverse set of brains thinking and, and discussing solutions um, that affect more than just late night eating habits. And, and, and what's interesting is that the result of this monoculture that is driving much of the narrative, you know, when we read Wired Magazine, when we read Entrepreneur Magazine and Inc., is the result are that companies are getting funded, you know, like this company Bodega, where they got two and a half million dollars to disrupt the vending machine or the cabinet. Is this really the best use of two and a half million dollars? Is there potentially another place for that money to have gone that might have you know, provided more of a utility you know, for, you know, for, you know, for the world that we live in. You know, this company, many of you might know Juicero, raised almost $120 million because apparently humans weren't getting juice well enough. We didn't know how to get juice. So they made a $700 juicer that actually didn't juice fruits and vegetables that you buy at a farmer's market. You had to use those little packs and what people who use the beta version of this product realize is that you could just squeeze the packs and it juiced it just as well as the juicer. <laughs> but for me, that's not even the funniest part of this is that they raised $120 million to build a $700 juicer. And in order for the juicer to work, you needed to have connection to Wi-Fi because they built Wi-Fi into your juicer. So apparently if your internet was down, there was no juice for you. You know, and it is funny and that we're laughing about it, but that's a, almost $120 million of venture funding that every, and then every magazine that was talking about all over the world, Juicero this, they're disrupting juicing. You know, that's an inconvenience. You know, that's not disrupting anything. That's not change, that's not getting medicine into the hands of people who are sick. That's not, you know, that's not solving homelessness. And then finally, this was the one that I discovered most recently, which I thought was really hilarious. It's a company called Waving. It's Tinder with just using your voice. So this is a matchmaking application that was developed for people to meet each other and to fall hopefully romantically in love and get married one day in which it's just the sound of your voice. And if you like the other person's voice, you click like. Because apparently whoever built this product didn't follow, I don't know, the last 40,000 years of human evolution and just threw that out the window and said, you know, this whole thing with us having like eyeballs and like seeing your potential mate, that's irrelevant to the product that we're building. And that's what's so frustrating is because what, what I'm gonna talk about now is actual problems. And I'll, raise, I'll be the first one to raise my hand. I love inconveniences being solved. I love being able to get Chinese food at four in the morning in, in, in Brooklyn, New York. Love it. So I'm not saying that these, there aren't a place for these companies to help us with our daily lives, but the narrative is too skewed in that direction and the financing is too skewed in that direction. And that's why I'm gonna challenge you all today, like I challenge myself working at a major media corporation to say how do we at corporations get involved to do what the venture capitalists aren't doing. And that is supporting companies that are actually trying to you know, understand what a problem is and are actually trying to solve. So I went out saying, saying to myself, because I run at Viacom uh, a data science and R&D department, and I said to myself, what problem could I get involved in at a tangible level that might help solve uh, a real problem? And in the United States, this is it. This isn't a Walmart where a woman is overdosing on opioids and her four-year-old's trying to resuscitate her. I saved you from the actual video. With 115 Americans dying every day, that's roughly like 19 every 20 minutes or so. So someone's gonna die by the time Sashka and I finish this talk of a, of a drug addiction in the United States. This is the year 2000, drug overdoses per 100,000 people by state. This is 14 years later. Right now, the drug crisis in the United States for opioid addiction is worse than AIDS at its peak in 1995. 
And essentially, we as Americans are almost doing nothing to solve this problem. So when I started to look at what the root of the problem was, what I, just, what I discovered was that you know, Harvard and other, you know, in a Harvard University and Baylor College had done a ton of research and found out that a lot of the real issue, it's isolation. It's something called social connectedness and that people who are much more likely to suffer from opioid addiction and substance abuse are people who don't feel they're connected to the world around them. They're isolated and they feel shame in regards to their isolation and don't feel that they have a way to effectively communicate and effectively be connected to the world around them. And what was interesting is that if you go back to that slide, if you're familiar with you know, the states in sort of from a geographical standpoint, most of that yellow that went up from 2000 to 2014 is in our most rural parts of the country. So how do we bridge the gap where we can do something to reach those folks in the most rural part of the country, let them know that they're not alone, and to let them know that there's an opportunity for them to get the support and the help that they need. And so this is where I put on my product manager's hat and said, how can we, from a technological standpoint, help this out? And so I started looking at the landscape of what's going on around user interaction and user experience, and it started with messaging platforms at the center of our digital lives, right? In you know, every year, about the end of this year, about 1.1 billion people will be focusing almost wholly on messaging, which is exponentially more than all the social media companies combined in all, the, in all, in all their social apps. Then, obviously, you have to be authentic and you have to be a utility. It can't be me first, which is great because I know as a corporation, a lot of what we want to do is me first. How do I create something and get you to click on it to give me the cost per click or the cost per impression or the cost per view? So this can't be anything in which at any point we're trying to sell something, right? Finally, you know, you know, not, you know, you know the expectation around being always on. So clearly, you're, if, you're, if you're suffering some substance abuse, that is affecting you always on. So we needed a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week solution. And then finally, in the next three years, 85% of consumer interactions are not going to involve interacting with another human being. And so this is what led me to this, this idea that, wow, not only you know, do, can we use you know, an AI or machine learning to help connect these individuals, but the research around messaging platforms supports that AI, excuse me, that messaging actually alleviates feelings of anxiety because you're communicating first through the messaging. You're not looking someone in the eye. You're not dealing with that embarrassment or shame when you're text messaging, even with friends and family. So I started to say to myself, could I find a partner, could I find a platform that would help me develop a technology to do this? And, and that's really about creating an experience and a conversation that would fit this specific need because it maps to what our product requirements are living uh, in 2018. And so I found Sashka. <coughs> He did. Um, so uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Standby. <coughs> we, um, it felt like it might be helpful to sort of give a little bit of background as to where we came from and, and, and why I built the, the platform in the first place. Um, when I was 17, my mom was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor. Uh, 11 months later, um, she passed away. So. At the age of 18, I found myself with no parents, no house, um, and really a, a sense of being at the bottom of a well. And what I learned in the experience of figuratively clawing my way out was there are a handful of things that are necessary to go from crisis to stability, and those, uh, those are sort of tethered by the sense of being connected um, they're tethered by the sense of having something at the end of the line that will see you broken, see you struggling, and say, I'm not going anywhere, like I'm here for good. And so Standby was sort of born out of this idea that we've built technology 
with the, as this tool that allows us to scale things, right? Like technology allows everyone to have the computer, everyone to have internet. We got to the place where messaging technology, machine learning and AI could scale our access to things. And so what could it mean to build the thing that I needed and that I had to get me from the bottom to the top of the well? What did it mean to have that and bring it um, to scale, ultimately. Um. So, I approached Saska because Viacom has a corporate responsibility initiative called Listen, which was a marketing campaign and a PSA, a public service announcement, that, that, was, that was gonna build awareness around the opioid epidemic. And I approached Saska and I said, how do we take the three pillars of what this public service announcement is trying to accomplish and actually take it beyond the public service announcement and just saying, hey, this sucks, we should try to help these people and actually do something that will help these individuals. And so that's where, you know, Sashka and I, you know, you know, work together and with her team to build out Standby that is the first, you know, AI-powered chatbot to help people with their substance abuse problems, where it's something that you can, you know, use the short code, you can text, It'll, it'll contact you back and it'll begin engaging with you in a meaningful way to hopefully pull you into a support pipeline. Right. So, um, so Cody came to us and said, hey, you know, you're building this thing that helps sort of support people and understands through ML and through AI and through sentiment analysis. Um, uh, can we customize it for heroin addiction? <laughs> um, and to the degree that it matters that we look at saying yes to solving hard problems, we said yes. Um, and it was a it was to, to be honest, it was a, like entirely a frightening prospect because this is these are life and death situations. These are these are parents worried that their next phone call from their kid is going to be from a hospital. These are parents and partners and friends, and this was a huge responsibility. So in building out standby, we did we we took sort of a two prong approach. What are things that could be tactical resources and ways that we could get some to support immediately? Um, what we did do is build. Um, a sort of a, a, a menu to allow people to find support when they need it. Ultimately, what this ends up doing for humans uh, in the US is that anyone in the country can text and find the closest geolocated NA meeting, and we can navigate them there with directions based on their zip code. Um, those were important to us. Um, and what <coughs> became particularly interesting is from a navigation perspective, how could the machine learning in the system allow us to understand who was coming into our funnel, who was coming into the system? What we learned is that there are two different types of people that we are addressing, people that were struggling with addiction and people that were supporting them. Um, so ultimately, we built the system around those two things. So the core tenets of what the machine learning, what the AI, what the NLU all allows us to do is A, understand personality. Um, our data scientist was the chief data science for eHarmony back in the day, so he sort of pioneered our ability to understand matching. How do we look at matching in a way that allows us to send people the correct resources at the right time? <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, what does the system do to proactively look at engaging with someone when it might be scary to raise your hand and say, I need help? How do we use, how do we use the machine learning to understand what type of person we're talking to? Are you an introvert? Are you an extrovert? Are you more likely to reach out for help or less likely? And then how do we calibrate the check-ins to allow for what kind of person you are? And then ultimately, where we think we found something interesting is the ability to give human insight, human-directed insight from our, our sort of team of behavioral sciences, scientists. How do we deliver behavioral insight to the right people at the right time? So to, to, to sort of close out, you know, the power of building in the machine learning mapped to a psychometric profile allowed, allows standby to actually get smarter about how it needs to communicate with you over time and what your specific sort of 
support needs are. So it customizes that experience because each person suffering from substance abuse can't be treated the same way. And that's been part of the problem in how we've been fighting the war on drugs. We've been just lumping people into these chunks, into these groups that don't really effectively solve the problem. And so, you know, to wrap up, the opportunity around the data collection and data sharing for this, for this platform and many others is the opportunity to actually come back with real research that you can take to a clinical research um, organization like the Center of Disease Control and say, look at all this information that we're getting from actual people with drug abuse. We're handling this problem wrong. We are talking to these human beings wrong. We are not helping them the right way. Without the data collection and data sharing, that becomes impossible. It then becomes impossible to take that research and to go to our government, to go to our policymakers and say, criminalizing this is wrong. How we're fighting the war on drugs is wrong. Look at what they're telling us. Look at what they're telling us they need as far as infrastructure, as far as humanness from us. And the technology allows that to happen. And for me, that's what really using a machine learning or AI is supposed to do. It's supposed to connect to a human need and not to replace a human need. Because ultimately, that's what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so I think in closing, there's a couple things to think about, right? How are we using AI? How are we using machine learning to ultimately help people feel safe, seen, and heard? How are we using technology to help people feel more, not less connected? How are we using technology to feel, help people feel less isolated and less alone? How are we using nudges and hooks and reminders to help people get better at who they are, build a better inner toolkit? You know, I built Standby so that, so that I could sort of scale the thing that I needed. And there's a meme that flies around Facebook often, which is that be the person you needed when you were younger. So what I would say is that whether you're at a large organization or a small startup, what is the thing you can do to flex the capabilities of AI and machine learning so that it can solve a big, hard, scary problem? Because otherwise, what are we doing? What is the point of having basically every technical capability we've ever wanted? We're at the edge of the precipice of what we could be doing, and we should be doing big, big things that help people feel less alone. So I challenge every single one of you to go back to whatever you're working on and make sure that there are many people at the table who can help answer that question and bring a sense of, a sense of challenge to what we're doing and really flex the muscle that we've been given where we're at now. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cody and Sashka.